I have to start with saying that I'm afraid I'm not a specialist in negation. Uh, and I have an illustration of this very point. When five months ago, whether I would be willing to speak during the conference and be able to say something interesting about negation, I should have replied no. Unfortunately, my lack of experience with negation led me to saying yes. So I'm, in a way, I'm sorry for what's going to happen in the next 30 minutes. Uh, one of the, uh, another mistake I, I made is the title of this presentation, The Social Origins of Negation. I would try to substantiate the claim that indeed the negation as we know it, so uh, in particular uh, negation sensu stricto, what we uh, analyze in our formal systems, would be impossible, so this mental construction would be impossible uh, without social interactions in a certain sense. But it is not true, on the other hand, that negation uh, in all its forms has purely social origins. Uh, uh, what I will try to talk about is first uh, whether and if so how can we uh, reconstruct the evolutionary origins of using negation. Uh, and my claim uh, is that it is possible to a certain extent because Everything, uh, all the mental constructions, all the cognitive constructions we use must be in one way or another an outcome of evolution. Whether it is biological evolution, cultural evolution, or the combination of the two forces. Uh, but how to do it in the case uh, of negation? So my view is that we should start from the simplest uh, cognitive uh, abilities, uh, which are in one way or another connected to negation. And because of that, the, the two most obvious places to see, to, uh, sorry, to look, is at how primates, non-human primates, uh, process negation, if they do at all, and then to see what happens in, uh, the co with the cognitive abilities of uh, children, of human children, uh, uh, whether they uh, understand negation easily or whether they have problems uh, understanding negation. Uh, 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 in connection to this and in connection uh, to the passage from uh, a child's knowledge of negation, a child's un understanding of negation to an adult's understanding of negation, I will speak a bit about the role of language and discourse or dialogue. Uh, and then I will try to show that finally we arrive at what we have right now uh, the ability to construct formal systems within which uh, uh, we can offer different, sometimes quite contrasting, uh, definitions of uh, negation. Uh, uh, and so the journey I take you on is a kind of uh, a natural history of uh, negation. So we start with primates. Uh, Michael Tomasello, one of the leading primatologists, uh, of today, uh, uh, believes and writes about it quite extensively in his book, The Natural History of Human Thinking, <coughs> that there are two uh, problems, uh, non-human primates, chimpanzees and bonobos uh, uh, face, which lead to uh, a kind of mental activity which in a way may be understood as using some kind of negation. The first problem is navigating the physical world, of course. Uh, and it is especially connected with uh, finding food, recognizing and categorizing food, quantifying food, procuring or extracting food. Uh, uh, so it's connected with food. Uh, more or less, I'm happy that my talk is just after the lunchtime and not before it, because uh, th this short, uh, this would probably ruin the rest of uh, of the presentation. Uh, and what Tomasello says is that in connection to uh, those uh, problems the, the apes face in the physical world, they use a kind of reasoning. It's not a re reasoning sensu stricto. Uh, it's, it's a reasoning based uh, on uh, causal inference. Uh, in a famous book of 2003, uh, Bermudez uh, claims that we can uh, arrive 
at our understanding of conditionals, even the logical understanding of conditionals and negation, uh, by postulating the existence of the so-called proto-conditional and the proto-negation. Uh, uh, and Tomasello takes this uh, idea and tries to show that this is exactly what happens uh, in great uh, apes. Uh, let us have a look at an experiment. This is an experiment uh, conducted by uh, Jose Cole in 2004. He also worked with, Ma with Michael Tomasello in Leipzig and Max Planck Institute. Uh, the experiment was very simple. So the instructor showed uh, chimpanzees uh, uh, two cups, and in one of the cups a, a banana was put. Uh, and then they didn't see the cups for a moment. Uh, and then uh, the experimenter was shaking the cup. Uh, and there was some kind of noise or not. Uh, and the monkeys knew what to do in the sense that if there was a noise, uh, they were uh, taking the banana from the cup that has just been shaken. Uh, uh, if there was no noise, they were immediately going to the other uh, cup. So what is uh, the uh, interpretation of this particular experiment? Well, Tomasello's uh, ex uh, interpretation is that uh, there is a kind of reasoning involved here. Uh, uh, in the case of condition one, so shaking with some sound, uh, it is a kind of abduction. So if the experiment, if the banana is in the cup, then when shaken, the cup will uh, em emit some sound. So there is sound, so by abduction, uh, there must be some banana in it. In condition two, the situation is a bit more complex. First of all, uh, the chimpanzee, uh, well, decides uh, uh, that to a, a kind of proto-modus ponens, uh, then if there is no sound, then there is no banana in it. And then it seems that the chimpanzee is using a kind of exclusion inference characteristic of this junction syllogism. So if, if banana is one in one of the cups and it is not in the one shaken, it must be in the other one. Uh, of course, uh, in Quite probably, there is no real reasoning going on. What is going on there uh, is a kind of mental simulation which the ape uses uh, to decide uh, which cup uh, to take or where to look uh, for the uh, food. So Tomasello claims that it involves a proto-negation. And proto-negation uh, is a very special type of negation. It is a negation in which we have only two polar opposites. So the food is in the container or not. Uh, so we have only two options. And when one option uh, is dismissed for one reason or, or the other, we choose uh, the other option. OK. The second uh, area in which non-human primates use some kind of reasoning is naviga navigation in the social world. Uh, so, recognizing individuals in their social groups and forming dominant and affiliated relationships uh, with them, recognizing third party social relationship, uh, relationships uh, with one another, and so on. And in this case, what is used is not, uh, 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 it's not physical causality, uh, but is agentive or inter uh, intentional causality. Uh, there are very nice experiments which show that non-human primates, chimpanzees and bonobos especially, uh, are intentional agents. Uh, and moreover, they seem to understand that others are also intentional agents. So here is another experiment due to HAR, done in two, uh, the year 2000. Uh, so we have two chimpanzees, a dominant one and a subordinate one. Uh, and the experimental setting is such that uh, both chimpanzees, chimpanzees see that the uh, food is hidden in one place. But only the subordinate chimpanzee sees that another piece of food is hidden somewhere else. So what does the subordinate chimpanzee do at, when the door opens? Uh, he does not go to the place where uh, the food was hidden, uh, which was uh, seen by uh, the dominant chimpanzee. It, it, immediately goes or waits a bit and then goes to the place where the food was hidden uh, 
uh, and it is a place where the dominant chimpanzee does not know uh, that the food is there. Uh, there were a number of variations on this experiment, but all point to more or less uh, the same conclusion that uh, it seems that chimpanzees, both uh, within the context of the interactions with the physical world and the context of social interactions, uh, use a kind of proto negation. So uh, let me repeat. A proto negation is a situation in which we only have two options. Uh, these aren't, th th this has nothing to do with formal logic. So those options are very physical in the sense that the food is here or it is here, or the food is here or, or, or it is not. Uh, so it, 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 it's, it's not negation per se, negation in the strict sense of the word, but it is something very similar uh, to negation. Moreover, uh, it seems that the uh, non-human primates do not use any rules of inference here. What they do, uh, most probably, is a kind of mental simulation which we interpret as if a modus tollens or a disjunctive syllogism was used in this kind uh, of reasoning. Okay, now let us move to Keats. Uh, and of course, when we uh, think of Keats, we usually think of uh, or uh, conduct experiments at the stage when language is already available, even in a very limited uh, way. So uh, the research over the production, the so-called production of negation in children has quite a long history dating back to the 1950s or 1960s. Uh, and it was established that there is a certain order in which uh, children use uh, negations. They start with what Bloom calls the non-existence negation and refusal negation. The non-existence uh, uh, negation is when the child says that something is missing. So there is no more juice uh, in the glass. The refusal negation is when the child says, I won't do something. So, no go outside. This appears at around one year uh, of age. Then, the third type of negation, which emerges only after uh, another year, is denial. Uh, and denial is a kind of negation that is uh, well captured by the uh, sentence, that's not lollipop. So this is not lollipop. So this is a negation of a proposition in a sense. Uh, psychologists uh, identified also other types of negation, failure, inability, epistemic negation, inferential negation, and so on and so on. But the, the three kinds I uh, identified are quite interesting because it seems that the non-existence negation and refusal negation are in a way closer to what we call proto-negation. So we have polar opposites. There is juice or there is no juice uh, in the glass. I go outside or I don't go outside. So there are only two options. These are quite obviously physical options. Two, only two kinds of actions, only two kinds of states of affairs. States of affairs. Denial is something quite different. Denial, uh, there, there are no polar opposites here. We de deny that, that something is true. We deny that something is uh, the case. Okay, but this is uh, children's production of negation. Now, the interesting question is, what is the children's understanding or comprehension uh, of negation? Uh, and there are uh, a few quite interesting experiments, and I would speak for a while about two of them. Uh, these experiments were conducted on two, three, and four-year-olds, as well as adults with the use of eye tracking. So this is uh, a special equipment which uh, ha uh, re records the direction uh, in which a person looks at a certain uh, point of time. Uh, and the experiment was like this. First, the participants of the children in this experiment saw the first picture uh, with the question, see the three boys, and then after some time, uh, uh, there was another picture saying, look at the boy who has no apples. Uh, and the uh, eye tracking device recorded when 
uh, uh, the uh, child fixed uh, his or her gaze uh, on uh, the boy with no apple. Uh, and if you look at, this di at those diagrams here, it turns out that for two years old, this is a very difficult task. So it's almost a random chance whether they look at the, uh, at the boy with, uh, with an apple or with no apple. Uh, uh, it is a bit better in the case of three-year-olds, uh, still better in the case of four-year-olds, and adults are quite good <laughs> at this uh, particular task. Uh, at the same time, when the directive is, look at the boy who has apples, uh, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, and adults do more or less in, uh, equally good. Uh, so there's a problem with comprehending negation, and it improves with the de child's development. Now, an interesting thing is the second experiment. The second experiment is, starts in the same way. See the three boys. And then the second picture uh, has two boys. One of them has apples, the other has something else in his hands. Uh, and the directive says, look at the boy who has apples. Uh, it's done quite well and quite easily by two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, and adults. But then if the directive says, look at the boy who has no apples, an interesting problem emerges. Again, two-year-olds have problems with this task. Three-year-olds and four-year-olds first, so it, it can be seen here, they first look at the boy who does have an apple in his hand, like here and here. And of, only after some time, uh, they start looking in the right direction, so at the boy who does not have apples in, in his hand. Has, uh, uh, there is something uh, else. Uh, an interesting interpretation of this uh, experiment uh, is that, first of all, uh, let us observe that, again, we have uh, a problem with, or, or a task involving a proto-negation here. There are only polar opposites. So the boy has apples or has nothing. Or the boy has apples or has some other item in his hand. Uh, and the interesting thing is that the presence absence, so we have a task in which the boy has apples or has nothing in his hands, is easier for the children to process uh, than the uh, task in which there is the presence of an object X against the presence of an object Y. Uh, I would suggest that this is due to the fact that they simulate, so uh, whenever, w whatever noun or whatever expression not the negation, but the, the main part of, of the directive. We hear first, this is what comes to our mind. If they, if they hear apple, they first look at apples, even if the directive says, uh, says, look at the boy who has no apples. So first apples, and only after some time, we can switch, or the children can switch to looking at the boy who has no, uh, <coughs> no apples. Uh, okay. Uh, now the question is, how to get for this, from this very simple use of this proto-negation to the negations we know, to the negations we know from the natural language, which again are not uh, negations in the logical sense of the word, and then how to get to negations as we define them uh, in our formal systems. Uh, my bold hypothesis is that this is possible only uh, through the participation in discourse, in dialogue, uh, uh, the participation in conversation with adults and peers. Uh, so, for instance, when you have denial, so uh, a, a use of negation, natural language negation, which amounts to the rejection of a proposition, it seems to make sense it, for it to emerge only when in the context of a conversation. Otherwise, I see no reason, no evolutionary reason, for such a uh, thing to uh, emerge. The same uh, counts for self-prohibition. So when the child says that he or she will engage in a forbidden action, this is uh, the use of negation someone uh, sometimes recorded, or epistemic negation, when the child says, I don't know. 
uh, without language, without uh, conversation as the framework, uh, those uses of negation would never materialize. Uh, and of course, those discourse-related types of negation emerge, emerge much later in ontogeny than those expressing refusal or non-existence, because the first two, refusal and non-existence, are strictly connected to what we call proto-negation, so what is observable to a certain extent in the non-human primates. Uh, the other types need uh, a good command of well, good discursive abilities to, uh, to emerge. Uh, and of course, we can show that the, the emergence of those other types of uh, negation are strictly connected to the stages of the acquisition of language, uh, and so on and so on. Now, uh, what happens in adults? Adults, as we've already heard this morning, have problems in processing negation. For instance, sentences including negation are longer to process. The door is open versus the door is not, not closed. Or the presence of negation in text has been shown to decrease comprehension and uh, also decrease memory retrieval. Uh, so I would say that uh, why this is so. Despite linguistic and more ge generally social training, the same mechanisms are involved uh, in the adult processing of negation, as in the case of, uh, of kids. Uh, so also, some, some kind of mental simulation, of using some mental model of reality, uh, is involved. And of course, when we think of mental models of reality, or any models of reality, it, it is hard to imagine how they in involve negation. There are no, no negative states of the world. So if we imagine a, a state of the world, we imagine uh, uh, negative, uh, positive uh, features thereof. Uh, this may be shown with the use of a very famous example. So the difference between simulation, understanding through simulation, and understanding or decision making through rule guided reasoning. Uh, when we turn to the famous ways and selection task, you probably all know it quite well. It's a task uh, in which you have four cards. On one side of the card, you have the number of years, uh, so how old someone is. On the other side of the card is what does he or she mean. Uh, so, for instance, we have four cards, and we know only one side of each of them. That someone is 16, drinks beer, is 25, and drinks juice. And then there is a social rule saying, if one drinks beer, one should be over 18. And the question is, which cards should be turned uh, around in order to check whether the rule was violated or not? And everyone, and this is what the psychological experiments say, everyone immediately says the first two cards should be turned around. We need to check whether this, as the 16 year old drinks beer or juice, and we need to see who drinks beer. We are not interested in looking at uh, the drink of the 25 year old, and we are not interested in seeing who is drinking juice. But when the, the same experimental setting with the following cards, so you have number three, red, number uh, eight, and yellow, and on one side you have the color, on the other you have uh, an odd or an even number. And the rule says, if one side of the card is red, the other should have an even number. People, people have great difficulties in resolving this particular uh, task. Roughly 90% of them do it wrong. Uh, and of course, the logical structure is exactly the same. And what's going on here? Some people, especially evolutionary psychologists, suggests that this is due to the working of the so-called uh, cheater detection module. So we are good at detecting cheaters, so we are good with detecting violations of social norms. But we are very bad in abstract tasks. I would say that this is a, a wrong <coughs> interpretation of what's going on here. It's quite easy to uh, prepare such uh, ways on selection tasks with the ontic uh, expressions, uh, stating social norms in which people will, will have like 10 or 15 percent of uh, correct answer. The, uh, a situation I believe is different. Uh, we are so good in the first task because we understand the problem. We can almost automatically simulate it in our minds or we have at our disposal the model of the situation. We make no inferences. We don't use any rules in order to arrive at the conclusion that 16 and beer Okay, are the things are the cards that should be turned 
around. In the second case, we have no, maybe when we are mathematicians or logicians, we do. But the so-called mortal men don't have such a model. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, there's the problem. Okay. And then we have logicians and mathematicians and people trained in logic. And they speak of classical negation, intu intuitionistic or intu intuitionist uh, negation, paraconsistent negation, diffusible, and so on and so on. Uh, how have we arrived at this stage? I believe by first initially reconstructing on, on the basis of natural language some uh, aspects of natural language negation and then by further developing our formal systems. Uh, so, uh, well, usually we will have no ability to uh, use negation by on early day basis by utilizing the rules of logic, the rules of inference. We can do it, but with a certain effort. Uh, and here is the last slide of this presentation, which summarizes this what I call the natural uh, history of negation, but in quotation marks. That we started some time ago in our evolutionary past with proto-negation, uh, and it, it only seems that we use real negation in those cases. Uh, it, it, this is prelinguistic and it is based on our simulating uh, the circumstances. Uh, then came rejection and non-existent negation, still quite closely connected to proto-negation, uh, but we already use language uh, for this. Uh, then we arrived at diff other kinds of negation, like uh, all those which I term the discourse-based negations, like denial, for instance. <coughs> and then we theorized this uh, into our formal systems. Uh, I, I know that there are uh, missing pieces of evidence uh, in this very short presentation of the natural history of negation, but I, I'm afraid I, uh, at least today I cannot offer uh, to, uh, I don't know how to fill all, all the gaps. Thank you very much.